I'm your host, Michael Schirmer. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to tell you about the offer from our sponsor, The Great Courses, this month is a free month of access to The Great Courses Plus app. So it looks like this. You have your phone uh, or whatever device you're using. You touch on the app like that, boom, and the courses pop up. Uh, there's a whole variety of them, really hundreds that you can access. So let's say you're interested in taking this one, the Black Death, which is one I'm currently listening to, and the 24 different lectures pop up. Now, if you're already in the course, the lecture will just pick up wherever it is you last left off, which is a nice feature. Or if you just want to skip around, like say you want to skip from lecture two to lecture 13, medieval theories about the Black Death, you just touch on that, boom, and a little summary of the lecture pops up you know, so you can read about whether you want to listen to it or not. Uh, and then when you're ready to listen to it, you just hit play and you're off and running. Now, if you don't want to do that and you decide you want to change courses in the middle, you can just do that. Here's a course I already took, uh, Understanding the Dark Side of Human Nature. This is 24 lectures by Daniel Breyer. Anyway, you get the idea. So the offer this month is a free month of uh, access to The Great Courses Plus. And to do that, uh, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon. Thanks for listening. My guest this week is Neil Shubin. His new book is Some Assembly Required, Decoding Four Billion Years of Life from Ancient Fossils to DNA, which just came out this week. Dr. Shubin is the author of Your Inner Fish, which most of you will likely be familiar with. It was a best-selling book and also made into a three-hour, three-part uh, PBS Nova series, which was really good. Uh, his other book before that was The Universe Within. He's the Robert R. Bensley Professor of Organismal Biology and Anatomy at the University of Chicago and the Provost of the Field Museum of Natural History. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2011, and he lives in Chicago. Neil is um, he's one of the giants of the field of paleontology and this organismal biology um, that he teaches. University of Chicago, and his book really kind of reconstructs how we know life evolved. N not only how we know, but how it actually did evolve from what we know now. Uh, starting with paleontology and working all the way up through genetics. And uh, as I uh, note at the beginning of our conversation, my interest in this in particular is twofold. One, he does a lot of history of science, which is one of my areas, and also he uh, inadvertently, without even trying, he doesn't even mention creationism, really addresses their particular claims of um, how you explain the rise of complexity, the, uh, w what you do with uh, mutations and genetic changes, uh, how that gives rise to new body forms and new body parts and more complex information, particularly the increase of information in genomes. This happens a lot, and now we can track it historically, not through paleontology, but through DNA and genetics. So super interesting conversation, wide-ranging um, around all these fields, plus all the famous scientists for the last half century that have worked in this field that, um, that Neil knew and worked with. So we get into all that as well. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Neil Shubin. You know, tough, tough timing on the uh, global crisis for a, a, a book author. I, 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 I have a new book yeah. coming out in, uh, in about a month. And uh, all book tours have been canceled, all bookstore appearances and so on. I guess we just have to ride out the storm. It's the new day. It's the new age. It's uh, the world we live in. You know, it, it change, it's like it changes on a, a dime. It's yeah. incredible. Just Is your, univers your university closed now, I presume? Yeah, starting today, um, it's, uh, you know, we're beginning to go to social you know, distancing. The, the yeah. lab's open, but we're, we're um, really essential people only in here, so we're really only open for um, uh, for animal care. You know, we have fish downstairs, lungfish, and things oh, right, like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, kind of eerie. The whole place. You know, I was just thinking because yeah. um, I, I uh, this weekend I'm at the studio here in Santa Barbara. I got to record some lectures that I'm going to upload, and then the students will watch them, and then I'll quiz them. And I thought, you know, if this turns out to be really effective, maybe they'll never come back, <laughs> and maybe we well, don't want you know, this to be too good. Moment, right. <laughs> We yeah. might be seeing a moment where we really are shifting and realizing what we can do remotely. Yeah, you know? exactly. Uh, I mean, I've never done the Zoom virtual classroom where everybody's online and, and we can hear each yeah. other. 
Uh, but I have to try that now. And what if that works? <laughs> That's right. I mean, I, this is the first year I teach anatomy here uh, for undergraduates. This is the first year I used virtual instruction for anatomy. We had a virtual, you have a, a an app where you can dissect a cadaver, oh, a digital cadaver on your phone, you Whoa. know, and people can do it together. So it's Whoa. augmented reality. Right. It's amazing experience. So, you know, that's that's going to happen this spring, too. So, you know, that's part of that. Oh, boy. Well, this would, be a, this would be a good test for the future of education. I mean, I still think we need brick and mortar buildings and face to face time with professors. But maybe there's a lot more we could do without the, the, the brick and mortar buildings. That's right. And laboratories, we can't replace that. Obviously, we can't replace field trips and things like that and field work. But yeah, certainly there are things we can do remotely. That's yeah. actually more effective, though. So my intersection with your book is twofold. One, you know, I'm a historian of science by training, and you do a lot of history of science in here, which I absolutely loved. I'm kind of an amateur, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> really it's, all, it. it's all good stuff, uh, all the way up through your own personal connection with a lot of these um, late 20th, second, second half of the 20th century uh, scientists on this. And then also my the other part of my career is is has been really since the 80s, combating uh, creationism and then intelligent design theory. And always the challenge that they put forward is, you know, just show me one transitional fossil, right? You know, I got one right here. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Now, I know. Tick, 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 Yes. Tick, Yes. Tick, tick, Sorry. Yeah. Um, but the problem, so, so they're a little sneaky, as you know, about this, you know, so, so you have here, you have a fossil here and a fossil here and they go, show me a transitional fossil. So you put tick, tick there and they go, now there's two gaps in the fossil record. I want two more transitional fossils. Give me more. Yeah, exactly. Give me more. And this actually uh, uh, leads to a, an interesting problem in evolutionary theory. Um, there are no really transitional fossils as if a species is on its way to becoming something. It's not on its way to becoming anything. It's just what it is. One of the more one of the more striking quotes from Richard Dawkins he, he wrote in an essay on the tyranny of the discontinuous mind is that there never what no whatever he said no Homo erectus mother ever gave birth to a Homo sapien child. <laughs> it, it <laughs> doesn't truth. That, it doesn't happen. So but so it, but that implies that species are a human convention that we 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 put right. them in this category that doesn't really yeah. exist in nature. But something exists in nature. The, you know, the definition of a species is, is uh, you know, reproductive isolation. They can't reproduce. Uh, uh, what was Ernst Mayer's? Uh, I had to memorize that. Um, a, a group the biological of, species uh, concept? Yeah, a group of actually potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such populations. I still oh, remembered it. You. Man, gold star. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, let's start there. Um, you know, what is a species and, and what are we looking for in the fossil record or DNA? Yeah, so when we look at a species, we, you know, there are many different definitions, but you mentioned the biological species concept, which was so powerful because it came embedded with a mechanism. That is, the origin of species is associated with the origin of reproductive isolation among groups. But the reality is we can't apply that to the fossil record. I mean, and then when we look at the fossil record, what we have are the anatomies. We have their shapes. We know what they look like. We have to interpret those. So when we find a, a fossil like Tiktaalik, here's one of the problems we have. We have 20 specimens of that intermediate fossil right now. It's a, it's, you know, it's a fish with fins, with, uh, with you know, arm bones and wrists and so forth inside. We have about 20 specimens, and some are big and some are small. Are they different species, or are they growth series? That's mm. one of the things. Or sexual dimorphism is the differences between sexes. So we have that, as paleontologists, we don't have the same data set that people who work on living organisms have. We have to use what we got, which is the, you know, the size and shape of these things. So we think with Tiktaalik that we have a growth series. I mean, the smallest ones are about four feet long. The biggest one's about nine feet long. You know, and the smallest ones tend to be weakly ossified. It seems to follow a growth and an ossification, you know, intent ex extent. Uh, so that's what we do. But you know, you know, when we talk about the origin of species, when we talk about the transitions in the fossil record, I mean, that's what's always captured my imagination as a scientist. Like from my first year in graduate school, was how do we explain the massive changes we see in the fossil record? How did fish evolve to walk? How did you know, reptiles evolved to fly. How did how did these major changes come about? And really, that's been the story of my own career. And that's what I tried to tell in the book is how we pull together, how we weave different lines of evidence, whether it's you know digging for fossils in the polar regions or working on DNA of living creatures. How do we take all that apart? And what do we learn? And when we do that enterprise, what we realize is that we're struggling with some of, even though we have these great technologies, many of the questions that you know captured the imagination of biologists have been, you know, have been around for over a century. So to really get to that, we need to understand the history of science. 
Yeah. We need to understand how greats in there that preceded us, you know, how they approach these problems. And so that's kind of in the book. That's why I'm always weaving, you know, people from the 1700s and 1800s into, you know, what we're working on today with, you know, DNA technology and so forth. So, you know, it's one of these great stories. Yeah, it's good to transport ourselves back in time, but it's hard to do because of the, the the problem of knowledge. We know something that they didn't know, and it's hard to not know right. it. Um, so that, you know, you you open with the St. George Mivart's challenge to Darwin, which was a pretty reasonable challenge at the time. And, you know, Steve Gould was one of your professors and he, you know, he was always, uh, uh, skeptical of hyper adaptationism. If you insist that something you're looking at right there in front of you had to be perfectly adapted, uh, for what we think it was used for, then you're going to have a problem with half a wing or, or half a lung or, or whatever. And so you're, I loved your, your opening thing about, you know, Darwin's uh, Darwin's response to Saint Mivar Saint George Mivart's challenge, which was the problem of incipient stages. What good is half a wing? So I'll just right. re read you, you 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 quoted Darwin here. All Mister Mivart's objections will be or have been considered in the present volume. I think this was uh, sixth edition, fourth edition of the sixth edition. Speech. It was sixth. Yeah. The one new point which appears to have struck many readers is. Quote, quoting St. George Mivart, that natural selection is incompetent to account for the incipient stages of useful structures, close quote. Darwin continues, this subject is intimately connected with that of the gradation of the characters, often accompanied by a change of function, which you highlight as the five key words. That. And that's really the start right. of your book. By yeah, the change of function. When you think about it. Yeah, because when you look at the world that way, we're so used to thinking that great transitions in the history of life are associated with the origin of, you know, whole new features. The reality is great transitions in the history of life are repurposing features that have been around for eons, oftentimes that arose for a different reason. And one of the best examples of that uh, is lungs. You know, we tend to think, well, lungs, you know, they're associated with animals living on land, but that's not the case at all. When we look at the history of lungs, they arose when fish were still living in water uh, to, you know, to adapt to different oxygen concentrations in water as an accessory organ. And when we look in the world that way, what we find is the antecedents are all, aren't always structures because the structures are already there. It's the changes in function, you know, shifting when and where a, an organ is used. But we also see that at the level of DNA. It's when and where DNA is used as well. So this notion of change in function is so fundamental because we associate the great transitions in the history of life with particular features. Feathers to help animals fly. Uh, lungs yeah. to help animals live on land. Each one of those arose well before. So the feature that's associated with these great revolutions in the history of life is never associated with the revolution that always came about earlier right. because of that principle that Darwin. Yeah, know, that was another. That was another great line in the book. What was it? Uh, something about there. The, something about the the origins of the first time something happened. It doesn't exist. I forget what that quote was. Darn, sorry. <laughs> oh, Lillian Hellman. Yeah. Uh, so when I was writing the book, I was uh, reading a biography. It was one of these oh, weird. The, the Lillian, you know, kids yeah, that that's right. Yeah, Lillian yeah. Hellman had the greatest quote ever. You know, she had a hard living life, right? And um, and I, I was reading her, autobi her autobiography, and she had this great quote, nothing, of course, begins when you think it does. And that quote, which she applied to her own life, applies to the history of life itself, because the antecedents are always different than we suppose, always stranger than we suppose, and always much more ancient than we suppose. You know, and so when you, you know, that's what we've learned in case after case, whether it's fossils or DNA, that's where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, here it is again, because uh, it's such a great quote. Nothing, of course, begins at the time you think it did. So lungs began as swim bladders, and those bladders were for what? Buoyancy or? or, or yeah, neutral buoyancy, exactly. And, and then if you look at the, so basically what you have in fish is you have a gut tube, right? It's a gut. That's where they swallow and so. Um, but out, out pocketing off that gut tube um, is, in, in most fish, a, a gas organ. And it's either an organ that is used as swim bladder for neutral buoyancy or a lung. A lot of fish have lungs, mm. you know, and so when we look at that and we look at the genes that, that, that drive the formation of a lung or a swim bladder, we find they're present all throughout, you know. So, yeah, so fish originally arose with a gas sac associated with the gut tube. In some fish, it serves for neutral buoyancy. In other fish, it serves for breathing air. And air breathing is very common in fish. We tend not to think that, but it's mm. really true. Um, you mean like they're, 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 they're or... getting oxygen transported across a membrane in a bladder, uh, an air bladder. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's, that's highly vascularized with alveoli like ours. Lungfish, you, you can, in some ways, their lungs are identical to ours. 
And it's even more, if you look at so other fish lower and uh, deeper in the tree of life, they have lungs too. And those compare mm. very much like ours, a right and a left lung. They mm. breathe air in, it's vascularized, they have alveoli, very detailed. And the genes that form them are the same ones that form our own, in many ways, our own lungs. Oh, wow. So we find, so why would fish have lungs? And the reason is fish have both lungs, these fish have both lungs and gills, and they'll use the gills when there's lots of oxygen in the water. But these fish tend to live in places where the oxygen content concentration in water will vary seasonally. So there becomes a time when they need to rely on a different organ. When gills won't work, they go to the surface, gulp air, come back down. And um, yeah, yeah, I used to watch, like here in Chicago, we have the Shedd Aquarium, and they have lungfish there. And it's just so much fun to watch them. They'll sit there, you know, and they're going to see them pumping with the gills. And every now and then, they'll go up to the surface, take a big gulp of air, come back down. <laughs> You know, and they'll sit back down there for another 20 minutes or something like that and then go back up. But this strategy is really uh, very common. I mean, there are a lot of fish that breathe air. Um, they either breathe air through their skin, so they have a um, you know, vascularized skin. Uh, some will gulp air and have a vascularized mouth cavity. Others have lungs. But either way, when our distant ancestors went to take the first steps on land, lungs, wrists, elbows, all that stuff was already there. Right. You know, they were using them to live in water. So the big shift in the transition from life in water to life on land wasn't always the invention of new stuff. It was using old stuff right. in new ways. So here, see I, that I, over and over. I think it's good to reinforce the point that multiple purposes are available, that you don't have to insist it. it's just for this one thing. Uh, and you That's just right. gave a, a perfect example of that. It's also a nice example of of um, sort of a co-op, what, uh, acceptation or co-op adaptation. It was used for acceptation, one thing, exactly. acceptation. Uh, Steve Gould's word on that, again, moving away from that insistence on uh, adaptive purposes for what we think it was used for, not a poorly developed lung. It's a well-developed multiple uses, swim bladder, right. sometimes lung, right. and so on. And then we rep they're repurposed. The change in function is the big part of the, the shift. So all of a sudden, these great transitions in the history of life become much more permeable because all of a sudden, you don't have to invent new structures. You look at it another way, you'd have to invent all sorts of new stuff for animals to walk on land, you know, lungs, wrists, and all that stuff. But now, fish are already using them to live in the yeah. shallow streams and tidal flats that existed in the, in the Devonian era 375, 380 million years ago. Yeah. Um, like the tetrapod forelimb, uh, which, you know, you worked on and, uh, or, or, or Gould's example of the panda's thumb. It's not a poorly designed wrist or crappy thumb. It's a well-designed something else that then can be repurposed, right. uh, for something else, for some other use. That's right. Uh, That's correct. And we see that over and over again. You know, I, I, I use as a lens, the, the transition from life and water to life on land, but there's, you know, this could apply everywhere writ large, in, including to our own origins, obviously, you know. What's the latest on um, the evolution of wings and feathers? They they weren't poorly designed, uh, adapted wings. They were well designed. What thermoregulators or something like yeah. this? Uh, yeah, and and so if you think about um, what uh, you know these these basal dinosaurs that are these theropod dinosaurs that are, that are the closest relatives of birds, they're all feathered, right? And they're using feathers not necessarily to fly. They're using feathers for thermoregulation, good insulation, for sexual displays, coloration, and so mm. forth. One of mm. the great um, technological advances of paleontology in the last uh, couple decades is being able to piece together from the fossil evidence the color patterns of these things. How is that possible? That's incredible. Well, there are these little molecules, these little cells and molecules that are actually preserved in the fossil record, and we can get a wow. window into coloration patterns. Really remarkable stuff. But, you know, whatever they're doing, it's not necessarily used for flying. Now, wings in these cases, when you think about the you know, sort of transitional stages in the origin of flight, it could be creatures that are taking ever increasing leaps and bounds, in which case a small proto wing would be useful. It could be creatures that are partially arboreal and you know, running up and down the branches of trees. Um, and in, in classical cases, people always thought that perhaps maybe gliding flight was an intermediate in the mm. transition. Um, so any and any and all those are, are certainly possible, right? It doesn't have to be for straight flying. Yeah, I have a picture from the Galapagos I took of a flightless cormorant. And it's, you know, they dive into the water, they eat moss off the rocks or whatever they do. <clears throat> and then I have a picture of him sitting on the rocks with his wings out and his little desultory feathers. He can't fly. They're kind of worthless. But you can see he's he's soaking up some sun because he was just underwater and he's drying right. out and so on. So that's an example. Yeah, they open up and they're draping it out like this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, penguins, they're not flying, but they have perfectly good feathers, perfect insulation there. So, 
Yeah. I mean, that's a story. And, 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 and by the way, you can take that story down to the DNA level. That genes arise for one reason, and then they're repurposed to be used in other organs and other yeah. places and other species. It's the same thing at the molecular level. Yeah. Yeah. So you trained as a paleontologist, so you've kind of had to adapt to yourself, adapt to all the DNA research, because that's a compliment that's right. to, it's, uh, how was that Very transition? Much. When did that transition happen? Really in the 90s? Yeah, for me, uh, yeah. So I'll start it in the 80s, uh, but then it really happened big time in the in the 90s. I, I, what happened was I was training as a paleontologist, again, lead expeditions to find things that critters that are at the, you know, that tell us about these great transitions. But at the time, there was a revolution happening in molecular biology, that people were discovering the genes that were underlying major steps in, in development from egg to adult, you know, where, where to place organs. And I, we're learning about how organs formed. Moreover, people were discovering that these genes are similar among different creatures. Like, we have versions of the same genes making parts of our body that flies have. Right. You know? And so when I saw that as a graduate student, I said to myself, ooh, I need a new toolkit. i got to retool. So it took me a little while, but I eventually um, learned molecular biology. um, And now my laboratory is very split brain. I mean, we go out collecting fossils from Antarctica and the Arctic. We um, work on DNA. That's why we have the fish that I'm feeding now, even during the social distancing period. (laughs) Um, And so what we do is we're really asking the question, you know, if we look at how, say, our body develops and how genes are turned on and off to guide that process of, you know, the formation of our organ. um, Well, do we see what are they doing in fish? You know, are they building a fish body? If so, what are they doing in the fish body? So we can we look at that sort of repurposing at the level of molecular biology, asking directly the question about the genes that actually build the bodies and the organs. And 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 honestly, um, that approach. When I first saw that people were doing that in the eighties, um, there was this amazing sense of like, okay, <laughs> I got to learn that now. <laughs> you know? um, and so now my lab is, you know, that's, I have a little a paleontologist, molecular biologist, but we're all focusing on the same question. Right. You know, they're all focusing on the, you know, these great transitions, just using different toolkits. And, and another one of these creationist challenges, how do you go from microevolution to macroevolution? And how is it possible for information content to increase in a genome without, you know, uh, uh, some, some sort of supernatural force reaching in to the, stir the particles and add more information. Well, I think you have this explained in your book about how genes transfer and so on. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, if you look at this repurposing that we see, just take the Darwinian, it's what's amazing about Darwin, okay, just to step back to history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is many of the concepts we use in thinking about molecular evolution came about in a time when people didn't even know genes existed, right. let alone DNA, Right. Darwin wrote The Origin of Species before we had any notion of genetics or genes. In fact, that was a weakness of the theory. Honestly, right, right. As you know. um, and, and before, obviously, even DNA. Um, but when we think about how new genes evolve, how, how gene function changes over time, what's the, what's the most common way for new genes to come about? Duplication, copying. Take the old, duplicate it, and then duplication, and then modification. So we see over and over again in the origin of new genes and genetic mechanisms, in fact, whole gene circuits that are active during development, duplication is a big process. Just make a copy and then have that copy take on new functions over time. So that is one huge way that this happens. But also in terms of the information in in the genetics, there's all kinds of levels um, that control how and when genes are active. And those have evolved over time. You know, so you can gain enormous amounts of complexity from having a relatively small number of genes. I mean, our genome, we don't have as many genes in our genome as, say, a lily or a salamander right, or many right. frogs. And the reason why that happens is we can have this complex brain and so forth is because it's not just the genes, but it's how and the mechanisms that control how and when those genes are active. Is you this know. junk DNA, so-called junk DNA? Uh, well, that's actually, so the, the junk DNA argument is actually very um, controversial. Um, but it, it's considered that, that it's that part of, so if you look at our genome, um, only 2% of our genome contains the information to make proteins, the coding of the, right. the protein. Right. The rest of this stuff are regions that are spacer regions, regions that are controlling the activity of the genes, so the, the computational machinery of the genome. One thing it turns out is understanding the three-dimensional structure of the genome and how it changes during development is an essential property of understanding how genes are turned on and off. 
So our genome, think about it this way. We have mm. a six foot long strand of DNA in each cell right. packed inside the nucleus. And what that is doing is it's all crumbled up, right? But it's opening and closing to allow genes to become active. So think about it as hugely dynamic. What that means then is that 2% that can codes for genes yeah. is actually being controlled by that other, a lot of that other percent. And some of that stuff's there for structural reasons. Some of that's there because it contains the genetic switches that control the activity of genes. It's enormously complicated. But we're beginning to take that apart using these new technologies that I talk about in the book. What would turn genes on or off? I mean, you often hear this with this business about epigenetics, the environment causes the genes to turn on or off or whatever. I mean, does the tetrapod forelimb, when the fish walks out on land and the the warm, dry environment causes the genes to... That's too simple. But what, no, what's no, that? no, more than that. So what you have is a series of molecular switches inside the, um, inside the genome. And you have a bunch of interactions between different genes. So for a gene to be turned on, typically what you have to have is a molecular switch sequence called an enhancer. Comes and folds in the DNA and, and touches a region near the gene of interest and then activates or turns off that gene, can turn it on and off that way. Mm. What you have is a sort of molecular chain reaction that happens to control the activity of genes. And part of that chain reaction means some molecules come and attach to the DNA. The DNA itself folds. It's an amazingly complicated dance. But the end result is a gene is turned on or off, or it's actually, it's like a little dial too. It can increase the amount of something being made. So what you have is during development, lots of molecules, um, lots of proteins and other things are being made by the genome. And those are factors that control other parts of the genome. Mm. So the genome is actually you know, undergoing this incredible concert of activity of different molecules all acting together to control the activity of genes. So here's the stunning fact. This is why this is all important. Is say the DNA content of a cell in our eyes, let's say the retina, and you compare the DNA content to the cell, say, in skin of my hand, okay, our hands, largely the same. Mm. Even though the retina and the hand, or and the skin and the hand, it's very, the dermis, the hand, or epidermis, right, the hand, it's right. similar. What's the difference? What's different is which genes are turned on and off in the retina versus the hand. It's not the DNA content per se. All right. So these switches and the, this molecular machinery that controls the activity of genes is essential for understanding why different tissues look different, but also understanding how the different bodies of different critters have come about. Because you can imagine subtle changes in the activity of these, these switches can lead to be, be, be great fuel for evolutionary change. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Well, here I'm imagining my intelligent design creationist friend saying, yes, the deity, the designer reached in and turned the gene on just for that purpose. Yeah, it's pretty, it would, not a very good designer because there are a lot of places where it doesn't work very well. <laughs> okay, all right. Or there's a lot of places where you have artifacts inside the genome, like sitting like fossils. I mean, here's one good case. Yeah. So if you look at our genome, um, uh, so we have a genome, 2% of it is the section that codes for proteins. You know, a lot of that other stuff is, you know, we call junk, but a lot of it's repeated units. 50% of it are duplicated units just from jumping genes, mm. like parasitic genes that just jump around the genome, land there, and sometimes gain a new function, sometimes just land there. Or 50% of our genome is essentially selfish DNA that's just replicating all over, the copying all over the place. Mm. Another about 8 to 10% are ancient viruses that invaded oh, right. our DNA that got knocked out. So we have more ancient viruses, fossils, genetic fossils of ancient viruses inside our genomes than we have of our own genes. Wow. And some of those ancient viruses were put to new use. Our genome took the virus, it attacked, they, it, it disabled it, and then repurposed it to make proteins. Some of those proteins are active in making memories, some in, in, in pregnancy and so forth. But anyway, if, if there's a designer, uh, a very messy, a very, and one yeah. who really loves history. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> really so loves history. Your, your point is that the, the, the signs in the genome and the fossil record are of a history to that organism, not a top down design program. Yeah, history, tinkering, tinkering with what you got, repurposing with what you got. Because yeah. it's, um, it's very cluttered, it's very messy. Um, there's a lot of stuff there that only makes sense because of history. Right. And that's the stuff that always appeals to me. I and mean, you see a lot of it in the genome now because the yeah. genome's just loaded with fossils. <laughs> you know, g genes that were once active and now are disabled. Your there. Um, sleeve or something is rubbing against your microphone or something like that. We're getting a lot of, yeah, there. Yeah. Let's try that. Now, as a, as a point, as sort of sidebar on the philosophy of science, 
uh, in terms of the acceptance of a theory without a mechanism. This is an interesting problem in history. Darwin largely got his theory accepted without any knowledge of the mechanism, in other words, DNA and genes. Whereas somebody like Alfred Wegener and his idea of the continents moving around the globe, that really wasn't accepted until there was some kind of mechanism discovered in the 60s of these giant cells beneath the continents that moved them along this plate tectonics uh, system. Maybe I'm not getting that. You're the geologist here. So, um, you know, maybe walk us through how a theory uh, with or without a mechanism gets accepted. Well, one of the things that was um, powerful about both theories, Wegener's in retrospect, was how predictive it was. Uh, they are. So, you know, when, if you read Darwin's Origin of Species, right, uh, sixth edition is the one to read, um, it is just a one beautiful argument weaving together observations from uh, artificial breeding in pigeons and other critters, right. uh, mm-hmm. weaving together observations of, you know, diversity in islands like Galapagos, weaving together observations of the fossil record, embryology. And all these different observations from these different areas, from the Galapagos, from artificial breeding, from the fossils, from embryology, could only be explained by one theory. It unified all these different observations from, from, from fields that are just dramatically different. Um, and I think that power to Darwin's theory is what captured the, you know, the, the eye of a lot of people, most notably like Ernst Haeckel and other people. Um, uh, and anatomists and paleontologists and so forth, because it explained so much that was already out there, you know. Um, and it wasn't until, what, 40, 50 years later that Mendel came along and, you know, Hardy Weinberg and all those, you know, and then later DNA and so forth, the genetics that sort of explained it. The thing about when we compare it to um, continental drift, um, the big difference with continental drift is, number one, it had a lot of, it's interesting, had a lot of defenders early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were mostly not in the United States. <laughs> right. So that's one they were mostly in southern continents, uh, like South Africa or um, South America, India, and things like that. Um, but the American, mostly the North American folks who were opposed to it, really had big problems with it, and that they could not. It, it seems so utterly implausible mm-hmm. that the um, the continents could raft through the oceans, you know, and not leave something in their wake, right? You know, <laughs> right. They had the, right. And the challenge there is that what they didn't realize was just how little they knew about the oceans. <laughs> right. We knew more about the surface of the moon than we did about the, you know, the, the, right. the, 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 I mean, it really wasn't until the late fifties and sixties, right. With the, um, right. geographic, uh, ex- exploration of the mountain ranges underneath the oceans. That was through, yeah. I guess the U S Navy and the other, other uh, departments doing this. Yeah, that's right. It was a Marie Tharp and a Bruce Hazen at uh, at uh, Columbia University. They were putting it all together. Marie Tharp saw this just incredible, you know, mountain range in the center of the oceans, and she said, "Hi, it looks like a Rift Valley." Uh, her own boss, Bruce Hazen, didn't believe her. So they called that girl talk. She said, "I'll show you." Oh my god! <laughs> so I'll show you. And then she uh, she really just laid out the case just hugely to the point where there's no denying it. Yeah. her work is really something, and just wonderful art too. I think much of science progresses without understanding the underlying mechanism and that that's got to be okay. I mean, we don't know what caused the big bang. My physicist friends tell me we don't actually know what gravity is, you know, maybe these gravitational waves or whatever that means, but we still have predictive theories based on understanding how gravity works. So I I think you don't have to have a mechanism. It's good if you can have a mechanism and other areas that, that we deal with that skeptic, you know, with psychics thinking, well, you know, quantum mechanics is spooky and weird and consciousness is spooky and weird. So somehow maybe my thoughts can be read by your thoughts and we can, you know, have all this ESP stuff. You know, they're looking for a mechanism. Now, to me, there's nothing to explain because you can't actually read other people's minds. You know, that's that's right. a, <laughs> so the, the theory itself is flawed before you even whether there's a mechanism or not. But I just yeah, find I that. Use, yeah, yeah no, I think that's very powerful. I mean, I could use the history of life to make predictions about what I'll find in the fossil record. You know, I could look at a phylogenetic tree, an evolutionary tree, and I don't have to know, like, why those creatures evolved the way they did. I don't need to know the mechanism necessarily of how and why they, they made the transitions they did. But I can use that history of life to make predictions about likely and unlikely places to find fossils. That's exactly what we did with the Tiktaalik. Right? Right. We were able to make a prediction, go to the Arctic, work there for six years and find that thing, you know. Yeah, uh, th- and let's p- punch that point because creationists always say, you know, it's not a testable science. You know, it's just a history, a historical science. Well, it is a testable science. You can make predictions and then go out, and what you find is either going to confirm or falsify your prediction. 
That's correct. So, I mean, here's a great example. So, like with Siktaalik, I was interested in, my colleagues and I were interested in the transition from life on water to life on land. If you look at the phylogenetic evolutionary trees we had at the time, it suggested that you wanted to look at rocks of a particular age, 375 million years old, from a particular environment, or near shore marine to a deltaic, like a delta system like the Amazon today. Um, and you wanted to have rocks that you can expose and work on. So we applied those three filters around the world, and there was one place that looked perfect, and it was the Canadian Arctic. Hmm. We worked there one year, didn't, it didn't find anything. We realized we were in the wrong part of the Arctic. Worked there the next year, getting closer, 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 six years, then we found Sictolic. There's a case where you, it, which is a creature, I should say, with, it's a fish, has a fish scales, it has fish fins, um, has a fish-like ornamentation on its jaws and so forth. But um, it has, if you open the fin, it has, you know, upper arm, forearm, even parts of a wrist and stubs of fingers in a fin with fin rays. Right. Uh, it has a neck. No fish has a neck. Um, yeah, it has, uh, it has a, 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 a skull of like a land living animal. So it's a real mix. But there we made a prediction, right? And, you know, the vivid example of the test of that prediction was the fossil that we found or the fossils that we found. We have several of them now. Was it Haldane who said, uh, show me the, uh, you know, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian and that That's would right. falsify evolution? I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, if we were like working in, uh, with, in those Canadian rocks that are 375 million years old, and I found a woodchuck in there, <laughs> that'd be a problem, right? Because yeah, that right, would mean right. things are grossly. Now, there are certain shifts, certain that you'd expect. You know, the fossil record is not, uh, is not very complete. You know, so you might, you know, with those gaps, you might have sort of ranges that extend deeper in time. But something like a woodchuck to, you know, the, right. the, the Devonian. Assuming Owen there Boy, wasn't some weird geological sh uh, fault shifting or something. Yeah, well, we see that a lot. But, you know, when you see that sort of thing, you can see the fault, right? That's right. where the example right. the rule, right? That's the Gould, Gould always had this favorite example from one of Dwayne Gish's books where he says, you know, if you pull over at a mile marker such and such on Interstate 70 with the road cut, you can see that the younger beds are below the older bed, the so-called older beds. Ha, 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 you geologists don't know what you're doing. And Gish is quoting from some geology textbook. So Gould went and got the textbook, and he said, yeah, but if you read the next sentence, the guy says, if you get out of the car and you walk over to the road cut, you can see where the fault was. <laughs> Selective quoting. Yeah, Not I mean, so, you know, when you look at the history of, like, the layers of rock, and, like, you know, which I do a lot when I'm in the field, it's just hard not to feel just how there's this wonderful succession of life we see in the fossil record. I mean, the first fish appear in the fossil record before the first mammals. It's right. that simple. Right. First mammals appear in the fossil record before the first hominids. You know, you have that level. Yeah. Um, but it's also, there's an aesthetic to it, too, i got to tell you. You know, here I'm working in Antarctica. Like, last year, I was, you know, led an expedition to Antarctica, Working in rocks about 380 million years old. I'm working on this mountain range that pokes through the ice platform of Antarctica. Cracking rocks in this Devonian. I'm pulling out fish, plants, tropical fish. Mm. And, you know, I'm on, you know, it's minus 40 degrees <laughs> right, and I'm right. on the ice plateau. So this juxtaposition between present and past, when you work on these places, whether it's the Arctic or Antarctic, is just so profound. You know, and, and when you show a student that, it's kind of hard. And you tell them, oh, yeah, there are, you know, there's evidence of an ancient ocean near in the top right. of Mount Everest, right. you know, the dynamism right. of our planet and its, its great history um, becomes much more accessible, that little, you know, that, that disconnect. Yeah. Was it John McPhee that said something about the, the tip of Mount Everest is marine limestone? I mean, if that's right. It's a capture limestone. that, yeah. Yeah, capture yeah. that vastness of deep time. Isn't that amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we see in Antarctica. It's like at the tops of these mountaintops in Antarctica, they're at what, eight, 9,000 feet surrounded by the ice plateau. In the middle of the you know coldest continent, there's tropical fish. Yeah, <laughs> and I have plants. Yeah, I uh, was visiting Calgary for a talk years ago, and my my host, uh, who was a big hiker, took me to the Burgess Shale. We hiked up there. It was oh, like lucky you! Four hours. It was like four hours each way. It was quite quite the ordeal to get there. But there, you you know, you're it's freezing cold. You have these you know these little marine marine organisms there. It's a, a, another point to make. I think is is, is important is is that. Hardly any organisms fossilize. It's amazing that you find any it's fossils because you know I what know. happens to an animal when it dies. You know, it gets picked apart by predators and and scavengers, and then it dissolves and it's in mud and it's eroded and and there's nothing left. So it's amazing you guys find anything. Yeah, it's like you know you win the cosmic lottery by becoming a fossil. I mean, first you have to die in the right place, be buried really quickly in a place which is not heavily deformed over millions or not hundreds of millions of years. You know, it's a wonder we have any at all. And it's what's amazing that we can find a creature like Tiktaalik given right, all that. Right, right. You know, I'm... 
I mean, something of a paucity of data that, uh, that, that it's amazing we have as many transitions as we have. So oh, that's there, right. Therefore, the importance of looking at things like embryology and, and DNA for other lines of evidence. Oh, I wanted to punch home that point to our listeners. This is what William Yule called a consilience of inductions, or more simply, a convergence of evidence from multiple lines of inquiry that are independent of one another. It's the independence that is important. They all point to the same conclusion. Evolution happened. I use this argument against uh, climate uh, skeptics and deniers that, you know, c- who think it's, you know, not, either a Chinese hoax or, or, or something less ridiculous, but, but that, that they're, they're all biased or something. No, these are, these people, they don't know each other. They work in different fields. They go to different conferences. They publish in different journals. And, you know, one guy studies glaciers and somebody else studies flowers and somebody else studies the migration of birds at different times of the year. And they're all showing the same thing. That's right. That's right. And that and, so that increases our confidence that the theory is correct. I know I was a TA in Gould's his, huge history of life class. Yeah, I love I love that story. Yeah. Like, Tell yeah, us about you know. that. Take, give us a, a sense of what that was like. Oh, I was going to be it was be fun to be at Harvard at that time because I, you know, I was like I'd go see Meyer for teas every Thursday. I was Gould's right. Steve Gould's Ernst Meyer, a great evolutionary biologist um, uh, from from the 40s and 50s. I, I, he was retired when I talked to him. Um, and Gould, I was just at one of his TAs. He had a raft of TAs, about 15 of us. And we'd, it's huge class, 600 students. Wow. Um, and he, you know, it would be like theater and, you know, Huel, he would bring up Huel and consilience and he would bring it up and says the best example of that, it, the most powerful was Darwin, right? What right. I just said, you know, right. we're, you know, pulling together biogeography, the facts of embryology, and these are only united by, right. you know, common descent, natural selection. But it was teaching in the class with him was, he was really remarkable, but he was also, he could be really moody. That's a little gossip. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we'd all, all these, all the teaching assistants, uh, would be graduate students. And we we're all sitting in like all 10 or 15 of us would be sitting in one corner and it'd be this giant lecture hall in the science center at Harvard. And he had an eagle eye for two things. One people reading a newspaper and people chewing gum. <laughs> oh no. I kid you not. Would and he call them s- out? 650 students, class would stop. He'd say, you. And there'd be some <laughs> poor student in like the 30th row. And you could see them like shaking. Newspaper, you go to the cafeteria. You're out of here. And he kicked them out. Whoa. We'd all be like, teaching fellows would be like, Put your newspaper away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Doing the gum. Yeah. yeah. No, he, he, um, he took it very seriously. He would prepare each class as a, it was a performance. Right. You know, uh, and. And he expected um, sort of certain norms of behavior from the students, which often came as a real surprise to students and teaching fellows. But it was an amazing class because he would, um, history would be important. History of right. science was right. so important to him. You'd always get, that's where, that's the flavor I still have in the book, which is that I learned that from Gould and Meyer, you know, is that we are, you know, we are, we're embedded in a network of connections that extends to scientists working centuries ago. And, um, you know, and so that, that, that taste for history, realizing how important it is for understanding where we are and the questions we have today, they permeated all his lectures. You know? right. It was always that. And so the, the lectures were informative, entertaining. Um, and the other teaching fellows, I learned so much from them, too. It was a great community. And we'd have lunch with them, lunch with them once a week. He was really kind of very generous with his time to junior college. Yeah, he was always very supportive of of my work, and and I got to know Steve pretty well. Um, just you know, a, a, a couple points on that. He um, wait, I lost my train of thought there. I was I forget where I was going with this. Um, oh shoot! Oh, oh, and I know I know what it was. So I published two papers: one on on the Sagan effect, which is that if you become a popularizer of science, your scientific contributions go down, and I showed that was not the case with. Sagan, the the the, yeah, the number impressive. of publications per year, even when he was filming Cosmos, right after that, I think he went through a divorce and he had you know the you know t- the Tonight Show and all these distractions. He was still pumping out you know like a dozen papers a year. Same thing with Gould, although Gould oh, yeah. Gould, Gould wasn't big into television, but he did a lot of pop- popularizing stuff, like his monthly column. You know, these are like five thousand word essays with tons of history of science where he would get the original Latin version of some paleontology right. book and read it and translate it. Right. <laughs> and and he, yeah. I was, um, yeah, I used to be, I was a security guard to pay my way through like part of graduate school. So when I was his teaching assistant, I was also a security guard at night and his light was the only one on it, like four in the morning, three oh, in the boy. morning. He just, yeah, that's when he did most of his writing. And he right. had this um, office that was just a, 
it was a library of science. It was right. just this great first editions everywhere. And you walked in there, you felt the history from all the, you know, the fossils. I wonder what happened to his antiquarian book collection. Because uh, when I went to his house in Soho, just before he died, he had, I don't know, oh. hundreds of volumes that are, you know, first editions of, you know, French, Latin, and so on. I don't know if he, if the family donated them to a library. You don't know either. Yeah. I don't know the, but the other funny it. story was, um, the, so, uh, amongst the many things I was collecting about Sagan's life. And then I did this with Gould was the number of honorary doctorates they received just to see how, po- as a, a measure of how popular they were or whatever. And Gould had like, I don't know, 60 or 70 honorary doctorates, you know, and, and, and then Ernst, so I, I, I knew Ernst Mayer also, he had like, you know, eight or something like that. And, but he asked me, how many does Steve have? I went, um, well, <laughs> yeah, like pretty... 50 or 60. He's like, oh, well, but mine are from the very best institutions <laughs> right. on the planet. You know, he He's was very competitive like this. Oh, well, hugely competitive. By the way, Jared Diamond only had one. And I asked him about that. I, he said, because when they invite you to, to give you an honorary doctorate, they're getting you to speak for free and I'm not exactly. speaking for free. <laughs> That's really funny. That's hilarious. But the other thing on that was, um, uh, let's see, what was my, my point on that was, was just how productive some of these, you know, scientists oh, can amazing. be, how competitive they are. And, you know, you've w- right. worked with some of the, uh, the, the most successful scientists. So what is your sense that, of what drives scientists like that and yourself really to, you know, the love of knowledge to, you know, make an original contribution. Whatever. That I think. So for me, I mean, there is, well, you got to love the, the actual doing of the science. You know, you got to love the process. Yeah. So people say, how did you work in the Arctic for six summers? Not finding anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I got, it was a paid extreme camping trip. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. And I love that. And you're walking where few people have walked before you're seeing vistas in place. So I just love the process. So one thing you have to do if you're going to be successful is love the process, love the act of doing it. You know, I love the questions. There's no doubt about it. But there's nothing more fun than being on the hunt and being in the field. For me, you know, um, I love setting up camp. I love thinking Mm. about menus for our expeditions. Mm. I love the thinking about how we're going to access certain rocks and what we'll do. So you just have to have a passion for that piece of it, the actual doing. You know, but there's all kinds of human motives as well. You know, certainly curiosity. But yeah, a little bit of competitiveness. You want to be there to find it. You want to, you know, we're we're a a a hierarchical primate species. (laughs) There's a little bit of that. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. I mean, it's, you know, there's all kinds of motives, you know, and, and there's honestly some days when I'm in the field, I don't want to do it. You know, I'll be up in the Arctic and, you know, it's the middle of July. We're in the middle of a snowstorm and it's, you know, we're not finding anything. I'll wake up and I, you know, it's hard to get out of the sleeping bag at, you know, when it's sub zero. Um, and you ask yourself, why am I doing this again? <laughs> you know, so it's not every day. It's perfect. You know, it's a human enterprise, right? Yeah. But I actually like the act of it. I like working in the laboratory. I like working with students. Just, you know, I just enjoy the process, yeah. you know, and, and to me that's, you know, it's all the better when it's successful. And in fact, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not remembered for my failures. I've had many, many field failures. Yeah. In fact, if you were to see me, meet me when I was, um, in my early twenties, I never camped. When I went up, I went on my first expedition. I couldn't find fossils to save my life. <laughs> uh, I was actually kind of a joke. I mean, really, and I, I didn't take myself as a joke. But everybody was like, "Keep it away from Shubin; he's going to break it." You know, kind of thing. <laughs> oh no! Um, but really, I'm not exaggerating. And um, camping didn't come easy. I was a little freaked out at night, you know, with all the creepy crawlies. Um, but you know, here I am, you know, 35 years later, leading expeditions to you know both poles um, and uh, finding fossils and so forth. And what kept me in it was I. I knew I liked doing it mm. and I stuck and, and it helped me stick with it and it helped me overcome my own, uh, my own failures initially, you know, my own struggles. Cause I really wanted to do it, you know? And that's what I tell my students in my lab. I said, you know, it's not where you start. It's where you end up, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's the values you bring to it, you know, which is really important as well. And so that's I, my story. I called uh, Ernst Mayer on his hundredth birthday. Oh my. I said, what are you doing today, Ernst? He goes, I'm working on a couple papers. He was still oh, he was a piece all the way to the end. I was, um, so I was, I don't know, he took a shine to me. So, you know, here's, you know, Ernst Meyer came down to my, I was I had an office in the fossil fish collection. I don't know why or how he did this, but he came down to my office and, and knocked and said, he invited me to a tea upstairs in his, um, and he was in the bird collection at the time at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, 
And that turned into a regular series of teas where I would come each week with like a paper or something like that. And, and then he would just go off on his, his recollections. You know, here is somebody who was there at the new synthesis of right. evolution, right. you know, and who was a historian of science as well as, you know, yeah. dabbled in philosophy of science um, as well as systematics and biogeography. His history of science was very much, you know, all roads lead to Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Read, it's true. But yes, I mean, he was yes. also. Well, the, the, really the, the other thing he said uh, when I asked him about punctuated equilibrium, this was in the late 90s. So, you know, Gould was at the height of his his game and his powers. And and and, and a lot of people had kind of read punctuated equilibrium as if it was some sort of force. Like, in addition to natural selection, there's this thing, punctuated equilibrium, that's causing species to change suddenly. You know, and, and, and Ernst said, you know, Steve Gould was my graduate student when he heard my lectures on allopatric speciation, and that's all that is. It's just a description of the fossil record under this process of allopatric speciation. Yeah, he was like an amoeba. He took everything, any idea he liked, he would like, I said that in 1926 or whatever, <laughs> yeah. 1940s. Yeah. But, you know, he was also very, you know, as a student, he was really just simulating. And it was just, there were moments I had listening to him, particularly when you talked about Russian biologists and mm. evolutionary biologists. I mean, he had a real taste for it. And he would, um, the stories I told his field work in New Guinea, when he did it, there were cannibals after him. Right, I mean, right. Uh, just amazing. Um but uh, I learned so much. And, you know, to hear him talk about Goldschmidt's, uh, this is when I brought the, the book oh, yeah, one the up hope, one time. Hear him, yeah, the hopeful monster thing. To hear him going, it's just like I felt like I was, you know, witnessing history in a way. And yeah. it was, um, yeah, it was great. Because then I'd go down and I'd be TA for Gould and I was doing, beginning to learn my own, you know, it was just so stimulating for me to be around these people who were often very challenging. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, yeah. I don't want to paint a, I mean, sometimes they could be terrifying when you were, say, you know, first or second year graduate student, uh, Meyer in particular. Um, but but as, but, a, as, a, as, a, as a point of theory, the, the punctuated equilibrium, it really is just a description of the, of the, why the fossil record looks the way it does. It's still just good old natural selection we're seeing in the in the process, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, when when Gould originally formulated, it was actually several different things, but way, the way it eventually, you know. The, the meaning ultimately was if you deploy ecological speciation mechanisms over geological time, it'll look like it's happening. It'll look like it's happening in an instant. Yeah. What looks to ha be happening in a very long period of time on our human or ecological time scales is but a blink of an eye in geological time. You know, so when we extrapolate these things, they're going to look very, you know, they're going to look really instantaneous. When in reality, they weren't. They were, you know, might have been, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, right. maybe millions of years. Um, and that's one of the biggest things because allopatric speciation can move very quickly. I mean, it can have very ha I mean, super fast. T tell you know? us what that is for people that don't, don't so know. So when you basically when you have allopatric speciation, you have one population of one species. Then, according to Meyer and others who were talking about it at the time, you have a reproductive barrier, an external barrier that would come about that would block, you know, the ability of you know what let's imagine now like a mountain range pops up or something like that, or a stream cuts through a, a field or whatever. That you know, one population can't breed with the next. Well, the longer those two are separated by that barrier, the more they gain isolating mechanisms just by virtue of you know, living independently for a period of time, such that when the barrier is removed, there you now have two species. Now, the 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 notion has gotten much more complicated because there we now know that you necessarily don't need a bar external barrier. You can get by without it in many cases. Um, but then, and then that speciation can happen very, very, very rapidly. You know. Um, it doesn't have to happen rapidly, but it can. So that could you know? be and a couple dozen generations or even just a few? It depends on the taxon. It could be, you know, come dozens of generations, definitely. You, be, you can begin to see reproductive isolation, most definitely. Um, it just depends on the, it depends on the critter. Um, but it's a wonderful, and we're beginning to see it at the genetic level. What are the genes that, you know, that, you know, that make two species incompatible to reproduce? Um, and it's just, a, again, it's another case where ecology, paleontology, and genetics can, you know, can be brought to bear on that one question. Now, w w would a founder population be a, a subset of allopatric speciation where you have, let's say, yes. a, a, a small number of, uh, of individuals make it to an island or whatever, and they start over there? And, and and they so they're what less genetically diverse or they have a certain tweak to the genome yeah and that, it's that, a small number effect so if you have a small number of critters that are sealed off from the home population by whatever reason that founder population which has a small number they can evolve in whole new ways remember because you now you don't have the entire genetic diversity of the original population right right so it's that so they plus you have a small population and so that you can have when things that are populations that are smaller the size effect is such that you can have changes happening much more rapidly 
in those cases. And that was a Meyer thing. Um, yeah, I think the, the the worst offense of punctuated equilibrium was an episode of X Files where Scully and Mulder encounter some monstrous creature, and and, and Scully explains, "Well, you see, Mulder, it's it's punctuated equilibrium." <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't no. know that. Oh yeah. my gosh! Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> it happened in a single individual in one birth. <laughs> That's Goldschmidt. That's, That's hopeful Goldschmidt. Monsters. Well, this <laughs> Goldschmidt was the objection like, to Goldschmidt's yeah. hopeful monster, right? Is like there's no mechanism that could possibly do that. You can't imagine a mechanism where they could possibly survive because you know, here. So let's just re- reel back. So what Goldschmidt produced uh, is a theory called, you know, which people have labeled hopeful monsters and macromutation. That is that the first bird hatched from a reptile egg. Right. right. You know, that that you don't need lots of generations. You need one generation. He proposed right. that you'd have these massive mutations that could produce huge changes in one step. And when, you know, he, he marshaled a lot of evidence in support of that. But the reality is there was very little support from how plausible it is like you know when you think of a mutation of a, an effect that large it tends to be t- deleterious or lethal hurt the animal more often than not though you'd have this they, this creature would have to find a mate uh you'd have to have right. multiple individuals in the species at the same time they'd have to be viable so from a lot of levels that theory of the hopeful monster theory was has, was never accepted in fact it was widely derided you know you'd learn about an intro evolution right. when I took it right. like here's this theory called uh, yeah. hopeful monsters and you know, then we'll, you, know, you just learn on what not to do in science kind of right. thing. Um, and it you know, really enraged Meyer, I mean, big time, to the point where he actually wrote an 800-page book in response. <laughs> he did? <laughs> that's, which, what which... He, that's what he said. That's what he told me. Oh, okay. Animal Species and Evolution. Yeah, oh, was, right, right, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, he was so pissed off by it. Um, and, but well, now we know. But that, it's, it's like saying, and then a miracle happened. Yeah, that's right. And that's right. And, you know, but now we know that the genome, you don't really need that macro mutation because you can have a mutation appear single mutation in the genome but then it could spread across the genome very rapidly right, right. by other mechanisms so you really don't need it to happen in one generation it can happen over multiple generations but still very quickly isn't but that one theory for the origins of human language um uh, just a single like ho- what's that hox p2 gene or whatever that Pox is P2, yeah. yeah yeah pox p2 right so it a single mutation in a single individual or a small number of people could then populate uh, an entire population. Yeah, or just take uh, some of the genes. This is the story I talk about in the book a little bit. Was that are uh, one of the genes involved in um, in in pregnancy, in the origin of pregnancy, of, of like in how? Oh yeah, uh, I love that story. Yeah, endometrium. And there's you have a single mutation, but that appears, but that mutation gets spread across the genome by these jumping genes. It was tethered to genes that jump around. So you had one mutation that appeared somewhere in the genome, and then was spread about the genome um, very dramatically. And that caused massive change. And so it's thought that aspects of pregnancy arose that way. And what's the latest on the human bottleneck 100,000 years ago or whatever it was, where there's maybe just 1,000 individuals or even less? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think there's been several bottlenecks, actually. And so a lot of our, you know, a lot of our genetic change is related to that. And what we have genetic diversity is related to, you know, these, these bottlenecks. Just think about how vulnerable populations are to disease. Yeah. To, <laughs> yeah. I hate to say it, uh, to conflict, uh, to the vagaries of survival. So bottlenecks, both in terms of the overall species as well as local populations, are a big factor in, in evolution and, and driving diversity. But it was never just two individuals, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, no, that yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't you know, too much inbreeding if that was the case. We'd never survive. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's go back to back to your book uh, with Ernst Haeckel and this whole ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny Walk us through a little bit of the history of that and where we're at with that now. Could we learn anything from embryology? Yes, of course, but what? Oh, we learned so much from embryology. The thing about it is that Heckel had his finger on something, which is really important, but he kind of overdid it. So um, when you look at embryos, and Von Baer, who was well before Darwin, noticed this, that the embryos of different creatures, whether they're fish or turtles or people, look more similar to each other, obviously, than do the adults. And von Baer made a whole theory around that, and um, which actually is surprisingly modern in certain ways. When Darwin rolled along, came out with the Origin of Species, Ernst Haeckel sort of took that and then pushed it even further. What he suggested was that ontogeny, that is developmental development, embryology, recapitulates or tracks phylogeny, evolutionary history. So he believed that if you looked at the developmental sequence of different creatures, going from stage A to B to C as they go from egg to adult, that that process would track the evolutionary history of that lineage. So that you'd go through, a mammal would go through a fish-like stage, an amphibian-like stage, a reptile-like stage, and so right. forth. 
Well, um, Heckel, and Heckel, by the way, was enormously influential. Heckel was an amazing artist. Yeah. Incredible artist. Yeah, beautiful. You know, just if, if he never did anything, you know, in terms of embryology, just the art he did drawing was just gorgeous. It turns out that that theory was amazing and continues to be very influential, but it's, 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 it, it's more, and he proposed it as a law, have a law-like behavior. Yeah. You know, in reality, it has nothing like that. There are cases where we do see that ontogeny does recapitulate phylogeny. In the development of the kidneys, for example, mm. we go through several stages. It's really remarkable, actually. Um, but it's nowhere near a general law. It's like, you know, Heckel's kind of good observation, not Heckel's right. law. Right. Um, but now when we look at embryology, it's, it's, we, we take a much different view. That is, um, we look at the genes that drive development. We compare them among different critters. We're looking at how cells work to build complex organs. And we begin to see that at a much more mechanistic level. And this is something that's just really just kind of within the last 30 years has, has gained enormous traction. You know, the, the whole field of evolutionary developmental biology, right. uh, which is something you know, that's been around for a long time, but had a genetic mechanism footprint starting about 30 or so years ago. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. And we do see cases of recapitulation, Heckelian behavior. They tend to be rare, but they, they're mm. there. But the von Behrian approach, which actually preceded both Darwin and Heckel, mm. is very powerful. Um, there's another approach, too, called heterochrony. And one of the great moments mm. in heterochrony happened in Paris, right after Darwin's, uh, Darwin's Origin of Species. Um, uh, Auguste Dumouriel, mm. I just tell this story in the book, it's one of my favorite stories. Yeah, yeah. Auguste Dumouriel was the keeper of reptiles with his dad uh, in Paris. And um, he was shipped. So some folks working on, you know, in Mexico shipped him a box of salamanders, and they said, you're going to love these salamanders. And the reason why they sent it to him was these were salamanders, big, reproductive salamanders, adults, um, that had external gills and thin-like tails. Right. They, and they sent it to Dumuriel saying, well, these salamanders are perfect living examples of um, the, the fish to tetrapod, the fish to limbed animal transition. You know, study this, and you'll learn more about that event that happened long ago. Right. So Dumuriel was excited, so he kept them, he put them in a box. And uh, fortunately, you don't have to feed them too much. And the salamanders are pretty robust. Um, and he came back a while later, and he found he had two kinds of salamanders in the box. He had oh. salamanders with gills, right. like the ones they were sent. But then he had fully terrestrial salamanders. Mm. So it's like he looked in the box. It's like if you put chimpanzees in a cage you know, one month, and then came back six months later and have chimps and gorillas in the same cage. Here he had two different kinds of salamanders. Right. And so he started to work on it. And it turns out that those changes were subtle changes to development that happen. Mm. That is, a normal life history of a salamander is they're born, or hatches larvae, swim around in water with gills and the mm. thin like tail. And then they undergo metamorphosis and lose all that stuff and become fully terrestrial adults. Mm. He found was that in his box, he was able to trigger it, that stage, whether they went, underwent metamorphosis or not. So the big difference in this case was not anything big. It was just whether they underwent metamorphosis or not. But the result of that was changes to the whole body. And so that's the mm. birth of kind of a new approach to development was to talk about how changes, big evolutionary changes could happen as a result of subtle changes to the timing of developmental events. In this mm. case, whether you undergo metamorphosis or not, but you can have lots of changes by stopping development early or slowing development down. So that approach to development, understanding changes as subtle shifts in, you know, the time at which development happens, the, you know, how long it happens and things like that. Uh, can be very important. So is again, this is this different than natural selection? Oh no, no, the natural selection is definitely driving these sorts of things. Uh, in the case of that salamanders in the box, not so much. That's direct uh, environmental influences on development. So in the case of that box, there was no natural selection going on. Right. In, the, in that box, it was kind of like different environment. Now the salamanders are developing differently. So basically, as we develop. Our gene, the function of our genes, very much depends on the environment that we're developing in. And that is very true for salamanders because they can shift on yeah. a dime, you know, and, and insects and things like that. Uh, we tend to be buffered from that a little bit because we develop in a uterus, you know. I mean, it's, we're sort of sealed off in our own little womb. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and everything changes when we're born. Um, but, uh, yeah, so natural selection definitely drives change in the development. But the one I'm talking about in the salamanders, not so much. Right. I mean, that's kind of an example, not really a hopeful monster, but it's a, it's a kind of a, yeah. a, a more macro leap than you would expect to get from a, just a grindingly slow natural selection process. That's very much so. And that's, that, that is kind of a hopeful monster in a way that you have, you know, whether you undergo metamorphosis or not in this case is a simple shift, whether 
in the amount of thyroid hormone that circulates in the bloodstream. So if you have a mutation that changes the amount of thyroid hormone in the bloodstream, it can change whether, um, whether you undergo metamorphosis or not. Yeah. And whether you undergo metamorphosis or not drives changes to the whole body, you know, not just limbs, but heads and tails and or lungs and all that stuff. So there presumably most of the offspring of these are not going to be adaptive, but a few will be. And then natural selection takes over with those that are adaptive and runs with it. No, they will be adaptive. I mean, as they're developing, they're responding to the local environment. So the outcome of that will be something that's finely tuned to that particular environment. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting process, the, what happens in salamanders. Right. So, and that brings up um, Lynn Margulis's research, which I always loved because, you know, I never really thought, why do mitochondria have their own DNA? But because they were not their, themselves eukaryotic cells, they were these prokaryotic cells. So this is this problem of the origins of life and then the origins of complex life. So talk a little bit about that chapter on uh, on the discovery well, of those things. Yeah, I mean, I think what Margulis, so Margulis was building on research that was done by um, some French and Russian um, biologists uh, decades before, and she codified it in a particularly powerful way. What she basically suggested was that one, con one way that major evolutionary changes can happen is by recombining creatures, that one plus one equals six. Right, that yeah. Is you can have separate species that combine in new ways to become a new kind of organism. And she really, early in her career, took a huge risk. Um, she was a student here with Carl Sagan, by the way. They ended up getting right. uh, married. And, um, uh, and you, as a graduate student, she was really bold. She proposed this. She said she looked at chloroplasts, which are the organ, you know, organelles and plants. She looked at mitochondria, you know, organelles uh, in in, plant, in plants and animals. And these organelles look like they have their own genome. They did. They had their own membranes around them. They did. And she said, these things look more like bacteria than others, than the nucleus. And so she made this prediction or made this uh, hypothesis that the, the way that evolution happened here was new combinations, that two different kinds of microbe came together to make a more complex microbe. And, you know, she, I think the story was when she wrote this paper, it was rejected, I think, 15 or 16 times before it was ultimately published. Yeah. I think about that for a young woman just starting yeah. her career. That's pretty, pretty bold. Anyway, um, the truth was on her side because as molecular biology came about and we were able to use the, the genome to do phylogenetic, look at evolutionary history, it turns out that the history of the genes in the nucleus were different from the history of the genes in the mitochondria and the chloroplast, implying that they came from two different species right. that right. merged over time. But I think that's a... Her, the reason why I like her example is it's a vivid example how if you want to make something new, it doesn't necessarily, it can be repurposing or recombining things that were formerly separate. Yeah. So recombination is a very powerful way of making new stuff in evolution. In this case, she's recombining individuals, but we see this at the genetic level all the time. Um, and, you know, so duplication, repurposing, recombining you know, all these things fit together for a view of how major transitions in the history of life happen. And addresses that creationist argument of how you get an increase in information in a single jump or, or in a fairly oh, rapid yeah. period of time. But clearly, oh, the mechanisms yeah. are there. By the way, as a side side note, uh, another interest of mine is creativity and science. How people, some, some scientists are so open-minded, they can see something that the rest of the scientific community can't see. But they're also so open-minded, they accept wacky ideas you know, yeah, she was like that. And, and Lynn was like that. I met her at, at, in 2005 at a conference in the Galapagos. I was speaking on creationism, and she was speaking about she. I think she was against neo Darwinism or something. She was de definitely a firecracker. But then she at, at one of the dinners, she goes, "I got to talk to you about 9/11." I'm like, "Uh oh." Yeah, she's <laughs> the, the truther. The 9 yeah. 11 truthers were just coming online, yeah. and we we're like, "Oh my That's god, right. what is this?" And she's like, "I'm totally. I totally think Bush was in on this." Wow. You know, here's yeah, a super she had that side to her. Yeah, she definitely had that side to her. I mean, you know, I mean, that's again, that's one of the, like you say, put, put it very well. You know, it's one of the that's one side of her creativity. Right. I mean, we have the one and we have this other side, you know. Yeah. Um, I wrote a, a biography of Wallace uh, and, you know, he was totally into seances and the whole spiritualism movement. And Darwin and Huxley were just, you know, wringing their hands about this. How can a great scientist like you fall for these scams, you know? And again, I sort of attribute to, he just had this personality, like, I'm open to anything. Just, 
you know, I'm just going to think right. about anything and then, wow, that makes sense. So you hit a, a few points that turned out to be right, <laughs> uh, but then right. a few that, that turned out to be not. Well, it's like uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, right? He, the, right. The creator of Sherlock Holmes, he was big into the mystical yeah. and all that yeah, sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, but he, he's yeah. the guy who created Sherlock Holmes, you know? Mr. Deductive Reasoning, and then, yeah, you know, he fell for the, the Cotton Leaf Fairies. That's an incredible that's right. story. There's a good movie about that. Harvey Keitel plays Houdini, and uh, I forget who who plays Arthur Conan Doyle. It's one of, one of the great actors. Anyway, but, uh, and, and there's a great scene in there, and actually in, in, in real life, where Houdini uh, contrives to do a magic trick for Conan Doyle. And he ha- it's one of these things he's like, okay, I want you to, you know, to, to walk down the street there and, 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 and write down on a piece of paper some passage from the Bible or anything you want. And so he does, and he comes back, and Houdini has like a slate with some balls of ink that he puts on the slate, and the balls of ink proceed to write out the passage that was on this slip of paper. And, you know, I don't know how it was done. You know, maybe it was carbon paper or something, and he was able to get what Conan Doyle wrote. But, it, but the point was... Conan Doyle is like, oh my God, you really, you are missed. You have these forces. And Houdini's like, no, it's a magic trick. You don't get it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to tell you how I did it, but I'm going to tell you I di- it's a trick. You know, and so, so please don't fall for these things that, you know, just, you don't know how it's done. And the fact that you don't know how it done, you, you can't go from mystery to magic. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's funny and it's an interesting way we approach the unknown, right? I mean, you know, the unknown is something that often you know invokes suspicion or fear or magic and so forth, you know. And and when you're a scientist, the unknown is basically an opportunity. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 that's the biggest difference, honestly. I, that, I always like to say, you know, what do you do with these unsolved mysteries? You assign them to graduate students to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a challenge. I take it as a challenge, you know. And it's uh, that's what motivates my. That's one of the big motivations of my field work, honestly. Kerry Mullis was a little bit like that, as you know, he won the Nobel Prize right. for the PCR uh, DNA stuff and. But he used to regale me uh, about astrology and 9-11 truth and what oh, HIV, AIDS. He was a skeptic of that, that, that link for a while. Yeah, yeah, the Duisburg uh, theory. Yeah, yeah the so. Duisburg theory. Uh, but, but again, he was so open-minded. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try anything. Just you know, right. give me your theory and I'll give it a shot. And you know, it's, it's like, again, so open-minded. You know, maybe someone like Sagan, who was also a great scientist, and Gould, who were skeptical of all these things. But maybe they missed you know, some big discoveries that could have been made. Who knows? I mean, it's just, what's the balance there as a scientist to being open-minded enough, you see the new revolutions coming and you embrace them, but you're not so open-minded that you, you go down the wrong path. That's right. I mean, it's about, it's, it's not only about the, the formation, sorry, I'd like to think it's like about the formation of ideas, but it's also about the testing of those ideas and culling them. I mean, you know, I'm always coming up with ideas, only about 99.9 and only about 0.001% of them are probably right. You know, but, but yeah, I'm always, you know, when people walk by the lab here, I'm always barking ideas and they're barking them to me and most of them right. are wrong. Right. But we just keep that process going, you know, cause it's this crucible of creativity. Uh, but then we select what we think are the best ones and try to test them or look at their predictions and that sort of thing. So are you a kind of a paparian on that, that science moves by this falsification process where you can't prove a theory. You just, you just try to falsify it. And if you don't, you're, you're the, your credence goes up on its viability, but it's always provisional. Yeah, I think falsifiability is a very big piece of it. But also, I think in terms of like Lakatos and uh, research programs, in the sense that you know we're making predictions and testing those predictions as well. And sometimes we can't do a falsification test, but sometimes we can we can bring about the the viability of a theory, the feasibility of a theory. So we'll keep that as a as something to. Uh, to, to continually work on. But definitely I'm popperian in terms of falsifiability. I mean, I think, you know, we have to approach it that way. Um, and I, we try to, you know, we try to put our hypotheses in a, in a frame where somebody can falsify them. Yeah. Um, it's not always easy, honestly. You know, sometimes we don't know enough even for that part of it, you know. I also liked your chapter section on uh, Barbara McClintock. I always thought her oh, research yeah. was super interesting. So um, that, and that was kind of a critical time in, in the study of genetics and, and how these kind of uh, change, macro changes can happen. So talk a little bit about her research. And- ah, it's amazing. She, what a genius. It's, I mean, I just like, and again, she had struggles, right? So she uh, was at Cornell and, was, and wanted to study uh, genetics. Um, and she was told that uh, her genetics is not a field for women. <laughs> like, okay, heck with that. So she, um, so she went to... Um, she said, screw that. So she went to um, study corn and corn genetics. So she was, so she shifted entirely. And it couldn't have been a better choice because when you think of an ear of corn and you think of the kernels on the, on the ear of corn, each one is a different individual. 
Mm. You know, it's, that's the amazing thing. Yeah. You know, each one's a separate individual. So if you want to look at genetics, you have a whole population and an ear of corn. And she capitalized that on that in a big way, doing some of the most complicated and, and elegant genetic crosses and experiments that have been done for a while. And what she found is that, and this was shocking, that to explain what she was seeing in her genetic crosses of corn, and she was looking at colored patterns and blotches on the, each little ear, kernel of corn, she hypothesized that what you had were little sections of DNA that would make copies of themselves and jump around the genome. Mm. And sometimes they jump in part of the genome and they disrupt the function of other genes. Sometimes they jump in the genome and turn on other genes. But she was basically suggesting that the genome is not static, that you have certain elements in it that make copies and jump around. Uh, and so she presented this and people didn't know what to make of it. Mm. Some people just disagreed sharply. Some people thought, well, that's just corn. You know, corn's crazy. <laughs> um, but it turned out that, you know, I think in the 60s, it started to become very clear that this is a general property of genomes. They have selfish elements, elements, and there's there different kinds of them. But in general, what you have is elements that jump around the genome. Um, and these can be very selfish and then they can jump and make copies of themselves and proliferate in the genome to the point where as in us, they're about 50% of our own genome are these selfish genes that have taken over. But other researchers have really capitalized on this in a really big way. Uh, Eric Davidson, McClintock herself, then Eric Davidson at Caltech, and a few others, um, and now recently, uh, including some folks I talk about in the book, um, have shown that what you have with these jumping genes is the capacity to bring genetic changes across the genome. So you can now activate many different genes. So when you think about the difference, say, between you know, skeletal tissue and skin tissue, it's hundreds of genes that make them different. Well, the way you can get those hundreds of genes acting at the same time is if they're all tethered in some way, their activity to, to jumping genes. So these jumping genes are very important to understand evolution. Um, and it just, the discovery story is so great too. I couldn't resist telling it. Yeah, no, it's great because, and you do feature many women in the book, uh, but, but the fact that it was so difficult for women to break it through in, in your science, how much better is it now? How much further do we have to go where we're really blind to that? Issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, I mean, we're, incre we're increasingly less blind. Obviously, the case where it was the biggest is in health disparities, you know, that, uh, and it's captured by, I used this, um, yeah, a virtual program to teach anatomy um, this year, and it turns out that the body that we had to dissect, and I was talking about earlier, was the male. <laughs> the male, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. You, know, you think about biomedical research was largely based on male, but male biology for a long period of time, and we missed whole windows uh, in diversity. And so when you think about something that's crucially important, which is medical research. I think the more we have diversity in terms of gender diversity and also racial diversity, uh, it's, it's essential, you know, to understand you know, our health challenges. You're not just going to do it from, you know, white male. But also in science, I mean, it changes the kinds of questions we can ask. I mean, I think, um, you know, um, the more kinds, we each have our blind spots. Yeah. Now, for whatever reason, for, you know, being me being raised Neil Shubin or me being, you know, living socio socioeconomically in the area I am, gender and so forth, we have blind spots. And the yeah. only way we're going to overcome our blind spots is have groups of people together that have different blind spots. Right. You know, we'll, one will find our way through this dark room together. And I like to think that that's what happens in science. We're getting better at it. We have a long way to go. But we have, um, we're getting better. Um, there's still a long way to go. Um, you know, we have lots of challenges, honestly, in the career tracks um, in science and so forth. I'm acutely aware of that. Um, that's why in the book, I like to tell different people's stories who face challenges. And a lot of them are women, but you know, a lot of them have just had struggles throughout their lives that they had to overcome uh, that gave them a different view from other people. That right. They somehow acquired that. They had different blind spots. We all have blind spots. Right. You know, yeah. Different blind spots that, they were, you know, that took research in a totally different way. And I love those stories where people see things slightly differently and they stick with it and then get it done. You know? Yeah, that's a... That's a good way to put it, because, you know, the, the research in cognitive psychology and social psychology about what happens with groups when they're mostly like-minded people, you don't have any heterodox thinkers in there, they're all orthodox thinkers, they all move in one direction and then kind of confirmation bias unify on a single position. You need more, you know, think, the thinkers out of the box that don't agree with you That's in right. the group. Right. And you need to, I mean, I think you need to be honest about, and of course they're hard to see, your own blind spots. You have to sort of suspend... You have to say to yourself, sort of like, I know I have blind spots, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> and sometimes right. it takes somebody else to show it to you by example. They'll come at it differently. And you're like, oh, yeah, I can see that. You know, so in science, and for me, it's sometimes painfully acute where I'm in a field team. 
in Antarctica, six people, and we're faced with a, um, a challenge. You know, how are we going to get to that mountain in the distance? There are crevasses over here. There's the downslope here. And it's just a, it's a problem to figure out. And it's amazing to watch people work the problem in real time. Yeah. You know, because people bring their own um, cognitive biases, fears, expectations, and so forth to it. And part of managing a group in those situations is hearing everybody's viewpoint, you know, and thinking about it, you know, trying to, you have to do this. It's tough. I don't, I'm not always good at it. Remove your ego from your own perspective and blind spot to make the right decision. Yeah. You know, and I like to think that in microcosm is how I like to approach science as well, you know, and you know, that's why. Yeah. That brings up, um, this issue of alternative archeologists. It's something I've been writing about recently after I did Joe Rogan's podcast with Graham Hancock. Graham is a journalist, but a lifelong sort of proponent of not ancient aliens, but ancient civilizations that predate the, you know, the timeline we think we know by tens of thousands of years. And, uh, and so basically his books are a compilation of all the anomalies that archaeologists can't explain, you know, like the weathering on the Sphinx on the foot of the thing shows that it's, you know, 8,000 years older than archaeologists think it is. And he, he has like a hundred of those. And I actually like that because I think it's good to challenge the status quo, although I think some people run too far with that and say, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's... There, there definitely was a civilization. Anyway, the day I was on his uh, on the podcast with him on Joe Rogan's podcast was the week that that paper was published in Nature about that archaeological find in San Diego. Oh, that, of, yeah. Of the, the mammoth like uh, butchered bones, mammoth, yeah. butchered, butchered mammoth, mammoth bones. 130,000 years old. Well, this would, you yes. know, this would increase the, you know, the migration into America by tenfold. You know, so I remember I called Jared Diamond about this. Like, what, what is your take on this? He goes, you know, the, the, you know, the half-life is two weeks for these kinds of claims of pre-Clovis by tens of thousands of years. Where are all the other, you know, sort of gray-dated finds that would be like 70,000 years and 50,000 years and 30,000 years, something, something like that. And, and I don't know what the latest is on that. It was the heavy equipment maybe broke the mammoth bones in a way that. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, I mean, whenever I see claims like that, you know, it's, 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 say, we can return to Sagan here. Special yeah. claims require special evidence, yeah. you know. And extraordinary claims, yeah. Extraordinary claims require special evidence. And, you know, that's, there's a case we have this left and right in our field, you know, that somebody takes you, you know, is it plausible? Maybe if you squint real hard. Is it likely? No. And, you know, look for the most likely explanation, not the, you know, not the crazy one, you know, and, um. Can be challenging yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but again, what what do you do with anomalies in science? Because no theory explains every single anomaly. You're always going to have That's this right. residue of unexplained things. What do you do with them? You don't have, to me. You don't have to do anything with them. We just yeah, say, well, sometimes it's a single data point that's kind of crazy on its own for some whatever reason, which you may not understand based on like if, you know the, some mechanism you may not understand yet. Others may be windows into a whole new world, though. Right. You know, so right. I mean. Yeah, you know, so every now and then somebody questioning and looking at that anomaly does lead to a new science. Uh, it's very, 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 underline the very bold, all caps, yeah. rare. Rare, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, that that's right. Um, I mean, there's a reason that we're so confident in certain theories. Yes, evolutionary theory could be wrong. Very unlikely at this point because oh, yeah. century and a half of cumulative evidence. Um, although, again, back to, to, to Graham's he has this whole thing about this uh, comet impact 12,800 years ago that, you know, wiped out the, you know, the, the, the megafaunal species of North America and did this and that and the other, and also wiped out this ancient civilization. But again, this week there was a paper published in nature uh, about uh, more evidence of the uh, like melting of certain rocks and metals by a high impact, high temperature, explosion 12,800 years ago. This is the uh, y younger Dryas hypo mm -hmm. impact hypothesis. Mm -hmm. More evidence for this. I, I have to concede, okay, well, you know, if you have more evidence for the anomaly and the anomaly begins to develop more and more confidence, uh, that's evidence. That's how science works often. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You know? uh, but, you know, you think about uh, the Alvarez impact hypothesis, the, the notion All that right. an asteroid, you know, caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. You know, at face value, initially, people would shrug and say whatever. But, you know, as they marshaled evidence with the right. uh, uh, iridium anomaly, shock quartz, I mean, different lines of evidence, oh, all right. of a, and then ultimately a crater, um, and all of a sudden it, uh, it changed the way we think. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Neil, I want to be mindful of your time, but I, I don't want to let you go without asking about the origins of life 
research? What's the latest on that? What's the best explanation for how life got started in the first place? Well, I don't know. I mean, a lot of that's physical chemistry, but I'm a real mm. fan of John Sutherland's work, um, okay. molecular choreography, looking at self-assembly of systems and how when you have self-assembly in the right environments, you can get uh, you can get components of RNAs, DNA, and so forth happening. I think the notion of self-assembly is, uh, is uh, in the right setting is a very big deal. One thing I can tell you, um, is that life got going very, 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 very early in the history of the planet. Um, extremely early, much earlier than we thought. It could have been as early as 4 billion years by some estimates. Maybe that's extreme, but it's still going to be over the 3.3 billion years we had for a long period of time. So the, you know, the origin of life, and if we, when we look at life, there's lots of you know, microbial life all throughout the planet. So it not only happened early, it may be something that's it's not a huge threshold to, to have happened. Maybe it happened multiple times. You know, in the history of the you know, in the history of the planet, um, but I, I'm a big fan of self-assembly. I'm a big fan of in the right setting, you know, the physics and chemistry can take over. What's important here is not only that you have a molecule that can make copies of themselves. We have that already, crystals and things like that. But the molecule also has to make copies of itself with mistakes mm. that affect its viability. So what you need is the origin of a molecule that can set up an evolving system, and there are lots of ways that, that potentially can happen. And I think the biggest find that could happen in understanding the origin of life, whereas if somebody makes a concoction, hits it with a lightning bolt in the lab, and then finds they have a reproducing molecule, I think that's going to, I think that's likely to happen within the coming so decade. By, by self-assembly, uh, you mean you just put energy into a system and things energy, start to happen? Yeah, either electrical energy or some kind of chemical energy and with of the right, you know, primordial components. You know, so you have the right initial conditions and, and you know, such a thing can happen. And, and, and RNA gave rise to DNA and... Yeah, well, RNA world is a very, I think that's a very compelling hypothesis. Yeah. The notion, that, so the thing about RNA can do is it can catalyze its own reactions as well as make copies of itself. Yeah. DNA can't do that. So RNA is kind of the right molecule. Yeah. And, there's, and, and as we discover, RNA is so diverse. It does so many things. It's an amazing molecule. And it's just, there's not one RNA, there's many RNAs different kinds of RNAs. And so I think as we begin to unlock the, you know, the science of RNA, we're going to come a lot closer to understanding the original life. Yeah. Well, that's one of those big questions that we have to address because of the creationist back to where I started. But, but if you were going to recommend, say, somebody who's an undergraduate or graduate student in paleontology, biology, whatever, what would you recommend they start studying? What, what's the future of this area? That's going well, to be I mean, hot. Well, people, I mean, so I, I'm, I, I am a very big fan of field paleontology. I yeah. think we have a lot to learn. There's still a universe of fossils to discover. You know, so my feeling is, you know, learn them, learn geology, learn the history of life, the, you know, the evolutionary trees that we have, because you'll learn all the tools to do it. But I got to tell you, you know, the more we understand about development and embryos, the more we understand about the, uh, uh, you know, how evolution happens. And I think, yeah. you know, if, um, if I was to bet, I think the more we understand about how DNA unpacks itself and moves the three-dimensional structure of DNA and the, the switches that control the activity of genes, the more we're going to understand evolution. Right. So I think strongly that the, you know, that the, the future of evolutionary biology is as a, as has always been, even only more so multidisciplinary. Yeah. Unifying like Huell, consilience yeah. of, multi, of yeah. multiple different approaches, whether it's the dynamism in DNA, the fossil record, you know, ecology and so forth. They're all important perspectives. I spent a day doing a, a paleontology dig with uh, Jack Horner in Montana. And at the end of that day, I thought, crap, this is hard. Yeah. And, and, and it's not, it's, and it, this isn't like Jurassic Park where you're uncovering some T-Rex yeah. in, in a day. <laughs> it could be dreadfully dull. I got to tell you, most days I'm not finding fossils, but you know, I hang in there. So you got to like, you got to like camping. You got to like being you outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You got to love it. So where are you going this summer if, if assuming the coronavirus doesn't shut yeah, everything down? I don't know. We have all kinds of ideas. I think right now everything's on hold, to be quite honest, with the uh -huh. coronavirus. Yeah, so I'd yeah. love to get back to the Arctic. That was always a fantasy, right. you know. So, But I don't know if that'll happen and just have to see how it plays out. Yeah, yeah. And you've done some work with, uh, I think it was PBS Nova did a, a show on your previous book, right? Are you doing anything with, with the television on this work? Not yet. Yeah. There's some discussions yeah. about it. We did a three-part miniseries on PBS about Inner Fish. Um, yeah, yeah. I love doing that. Gosh, it was so much fun. Yeah, it was a great show. Oh, thank you. I just had so much fun doing it and interacting with great people. Yeah. And now we've, we're under discussion of this one, but no plans yet now. Yeah. And what's the next book you're going to work on? I don't know. I mean, I, one of the things I'd like to do is I've worked at the polls, you know, both poles, south and north for a long period of time. I'm oh, yeah? very interested in doing something. I'm kind of trying to link that to understanding the planet and life and the cosmos and so forth, because work at the polls is so important. So I'm, I'm sort of 
Yeah, if I do something, it'll probably be polar. Uh, and some, what really excites me. How about Martian paleontology? Martian paleontology. <laughs> I've always said, you know, we need a paleontologist on Mars. And we're sending robotic ones up there, so that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> For now, right. For now, yeah. Uh, you know, I did see something in the news, parenthetically, about um, the Viking specimens that they were, somebody was reconsidering whether there was organic chemistry in those specimens. Oh, yeah? Don't I, don't, I don't know. You know, these things pop up. Same thing with that Martian rock during Clinton's administration oh, yeah, he the, held uh, that Antarctic meteorite yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. but that yeah, never... the pieces from Mars the land you know nothing ever done us it was not never came to anything again that's it, back to anomalies those are like ooh that's a really quirky anomaly what does it mean and then you let it play out it's like nothing <laughs> yeah, that's right no that's that's the nature of science but yeah. people make claims then we test those claims right and more often than not in the press we're reading the claim you know from the nature papers usually a claim right. you know it's a lot of evidence supporting it but still, a lot of work has to play out before we accept that claim. So right, that's kind of right. when we communicate science, you know, what's, where right. are we in the, in right. the fact check piece. So. Right. Well, again, Neil, thanks for writing this super interesting book, Some Assembly Required, Decoding Four Billion Years of Life from Ancient Fossils to DNA. It's a great story. Congratulations on the book. Thanks for coming Thank on the you, show. Michael. That's great to be here. Thank you. <laughs> okay.